All right, guys. So uh, uh, welcome to our annual anniversary IPMS Zoom meeting. I, one year ago, we started one year ago uh, doing these Zoom calls and already a year has flashed by. Uh, so uh, what I want to do is we have a, we're going to do our usual show and tell. Um, I think we got a short uh, video from, from Gates uh, that he may will show later on. Um, but first, I want to uh, introduce a special guest, Mark Norman. Wave, Mark. Uh, Mark is, um, I'll, I'll just give you a bit, Mark is, is our fellow American modeler. Uh, Mark Norman joined the Hudson Valley IPMS chapter uh, in the late 90s, and he founded the local AMPS chapter seven years ago, and more recently created the Hudson Valley Shipbuilders. Uh, Mark retired from IBM a short time ago, congratulations Mark, uh, and he hosts a modeling Zoom call that just celebrated its first anniversary last week as well. So like us, you've got that first anniversary. Uh, and so we're really uh, grateful to have Mark on board tonight. Uh, he had me as a guest as well in their local chapter and that was really fun. And we hope to have these collaborative, uh, what I call 1812, no, that's the wrong number. Um, other types of, <laughs> no hard feelings there, uh, Mark on the White House. Um, we, we promised that we'll repaint it. We tried to get down there when Trump was there, but nobody would let us near it, so. Uh, <laughs> Hopefully things are now stabilized down in Washington, D.C. and our best to you. All right, so uh, Mark is going to, now Mark, did you want to share your screen or did you want us to play the, the PowerPoint? What, what do you want, to, what's your preference? Well, you mean the Wingnut Wings presentation? Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, I can, I can share my screen. Okay, do you want to say a few words or anything or I'll just open it up to you? And what we'll do is the presentation, guys, will be about 20 minutes and Mark will stop here and there for uh, some questions. We'll do the show and tell after. Okay. All right. Go. That's all. The floor is yours, Mark. Welcome aboard. Well, but in the meantime, I wanted to thank you for inviting me on the call. I almost feel like I've been a little bit a part of this group because I've been, um, you know, watching the Hornet Hobbies videos for a long time. I think it was the first time I ever got experience with uh, um, Michael Rinaldi. Mm. And of course, the um, garage studio stuff is uh, fantastic. And you've got uh, Bob and Dave do a great job of presenting those. And uh, I mean, I'm learning all about um, color modulation for Panzer Gray. And of course, Harvey, he goes without saying, um, his leadership is there. He came uh, forward with us and has been on a few New York calls to let us know what, what's going on up there. And we're letting them know what's going on down there. Cause it's it, a little bit hard this year when you consider that the border's closed. A lot of the shows, aren't taking place. So we're not seeing some of the familiar faces from up in Canada that we're used to. So um, again, thanks for um, having me in this group. I'm a little bit uh, humbled by the these modelers because I know the quality of the work you guys put out. In fact, I've even been on a few streaming meetings on Facebook. <laughs> I know you probably wonder, is there anybody out there really sitting in on a meeting? But Harvey, you did a great presentation on uh, the defense of Hong Kong. So I'm hoping maybe we can get you down uh, to do that in a Zoom here. So, uh, sounds swell. Anytime, Mark. Anytime. Sure. Well, let me see if I can share my screen now. Okay. And while Mark's uh, sharing his screen, he's going to do a presentation on all of our favorite uh, World War I aircraft, wing not wings. Ooh, nice. Yeah. Are we getting okay. that? Um, are we Everybody getting see that? that? Yeah, we see it. Well, Perfect. It's, been, it's been a little um, less than a year since we lost wing nut wings. As you all know, they're basically one of these uh, hobby companies that we all admired. In fact, we had Brett Green on one of our Zoom calls and he said, you know, this, I said, is there ever gonna be another wing and it wings? And he said, probably not. It was something that just came and went. And uh, no one really knows exactly what happens. Uh, the, 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 as you know, the company put out just one press release saying that they were gonna go dormant at their website for COVID. So there's a lot of theories bouncing around and I just wanted to postulate a few different ideas for you guys and see what you guys think. Okay. So this is sort of an analogy here. Um, what really did them in? Was it um, the airplanes, you know, the models or was it the beauty? You know, the, Sir Peter Jackson's um, interest in wingnut wings, maybe not what it used to be and why. So you can't really talk about wingnut wings until you talk about Peter Jackson. And you know, is he a hero or is he a villain? He's worth about $400 million US. 
and uh, has got a lot of activity going on. You know, it's the Lord of the Rings movies, uh, the Hobbit movies. So very, very busy guy. And uh, he founded Wingnut Wings back in uh, 2009 and said at the time that they weren't going to ever be profit more oriented. So this was kind of a hobby business. Uh, he ran it very remotely. He only looked at maybe a newsletter from the GM once a week. So he did have complete control over the actual subjects that they modeled. And that's where I'm starting to kind of let you guys know that maybe that was creating some of the problems for their long-term viability. So was it the planes? Well, if you can remember back that far, and it's certainly for me, not that long ago, um, they had a lot of initial releases of the uh, single seater fighters and they were, you know, everything seemed to just mesh. You had terrific manuals, you had beautiful box art, beautiful molding. And these are very <coughs> popular subjects that most people knew all about. So I don't mean to go through a complete history of every release, but as you can see, these were all pretty um, things to get your juices going if you're a World War I fan, and even if you're not. And then they got into the two-seaters, which were, I think, a little more unusual. Peter Jackson liked those a lot because there were quite a few of them. And you can see some of these, uh, I remember when they would have a new release, I, I would never have even known about the aircraft unless they had released a, a full model of it. That, that picture there, uh, Mark, is, is one of the rare ones, if you can get that one, that one, yep. That one's yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go over where they are now in terms of sourcing mm, the great. kits in a minute. Great, great. And you know, this is Steve Anderson, some of his great box art. I don't think this was actually on a model, but you can just see all the things going on in this. And this is what I think we all grew up, looking at the Ravel and Monogram box art and getting excited about what was inside in the kit. And then you remember they, uh, they started to come out with much bigger models. Here's the Gotha. And I think, um, Harvey, this is also kind of a, a rare bird too, or at least one that costs a lot of money now on the, on the used market. But you know, a lot more complex builds, bigger models. I think this uh, Gotha float plane, there was only one ever made in real, real life. So you know, very rare subjects that weren't top of mind for people. And the price started creeping up, creeping up too. So this is pretty much where they ended up, and you can see the departure into the um, the Lancasters and the Dam Busters. And if you if you follow Peter Jackson, he's always wanted to remake the Dam Busters movie, and that was actually on the table when he formed Wingnut Wings back in 2009. But the project so far has not really uh, taken off, and some of it has to do with him getting um, recruited at the last minute to do the Hobbit series. He came into that series, there were no storyboards, they needed, the, uh, the other director had dropped off. So he, uh, he jumped into that and that started to delay things and distract him. But one of the ideas that he had for a model was um, the Hadley Page. And you can see this is a, a big airplane. And um, if you know the way Wingnut Wings do, does things, they're gonna do a good, good job with it. But you know, here's some of the complexity of if a model like that came out, what you'd have to deal with. I mean, this is definitely a Harvey Lowe type build. <laughs> and here's the, here's the case of the size of the model. And you can see that um, in this scale, 132nd, a person's gonna be about two and a quarter inches. So you can see how really large that was. But we got to see it. I think that those of you that were able to make it down to Chattanooga um, got to see the <laughs> Wingnut Wings um, exhibit. <clears throat> and they had the test shots of the uh, Hadley page there, along with some of the other models that were due to be released soon. So here we are with all this momentum, all these great models out there, but really a questionable business plan because at least in the case of the uh, Lancaster, uh, Hong Kong Models is already coming out with one at about half the price. But you can see this is the dam burster version. That's not a 55 gallon drum down there, it's a skip bomb. I can't imagine what, how I would lay in the clear plastic on those uh, delicate canopies and clean the parts, it's gotta be really tough. But everybody was favorably impressed down in Chattanooga 
And then one of the things they talked about was uh, that Peter Jackson, I heard, actually had built two Lancasters for this project. Now, the Dan Buster project was supposed to be a movie, but I, as I said before, there were a lot of distractions for him and his team. And uh, he sort of has always been trying to get this off the ground. One of the things they wanted to do was make it into a miniseries, like maybe Band of Brothers or The Pacific. So um, some reporters did some homework and they found these two one for one scale Lancasters that he had built in China and apparently moved to, uh, disassembled and moved to New Zealand. Now, when you look at this, do you guys see anything on this picture that you might think, well, maybe this isn't a real Lancaster, it might be something else? Hmm. Apart from this angle. Uh, look like they're, uh, they're not Merlins or there's something odd about them. Okay. Yeah, I thought uh, the engines I, look like they're almost like they're Halifax engines. Yeah, I was just going to say the same thing. Well, I thought the landing gear looked a bit strange. It could be the way the light's hitting it, but it almost looks like it wouldn't be enough heft in the landing gear to support all of those um, engines in that airplane. Hmm. But it could be just, again, the way the picture was taken. Hmm. So here he is with the Dan Busters in the, um, the hangar. Did you guys know that he had actually built two? No. Well, they're really just, they're really just movie props. They're not real Dan Busters. <coughs> the reason why I say that is because in the newspaper article, it talks about how his team built these in two weeks. And I really doubt they built a full flying replica of a, a Lancaster in two weeks. Why is Stephen Fry there? <laughs> Who's that? The the gentleman in the blue shirt. Could this be from some English television show or something? Maybe he's interviewing him. He sure mm. looks like Stephen Fry. Yeah, yeah. Stephen Fry. It is. Okay. So there's a lot you can do with a one for one <laughs> replica, and it certainly looks convincing. It certainly does. So, so if you look at the, the Greyhound movie, this is the USS Kid which is down in Baton Rouge Harbor in Louisiana. And you know you can do a lot with a one-for-one -one, um, museum ship and make some very big green screens and you can see the camera on the boom there. So perhaps the, uh, the two Lancasters would go a long way to giving him the kind of production values he'd want to make a realistic movie on that famous 617 squadron. Now, this is apparently, we didn't see test shots for this down in Chattanooga, but this was going to be one of their single, his single seat um, announcements. Does anybody, can anybody identify this aircraft? Hansa Brandenburg. It's a Hansa Brandenburg. Star Strutter. Very good. It's a Star I love the name because the struts are like stars. Star Strutter. Yeah, there's no rigging, I believe, on this aircraft. No, there was it was an early experiment and not and not really. Mark, we're losing you for some reason. No. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. I can hear you. Okay. Um, okay. So what's happening with all those molds? There's a lot of speculation, but the employees that uh, came out and I listened to their interviews on some of the modeling podcasts say that don't expect them to come out soon. These are Sir, Sir Peter's pride and joy. Why would he put sink all of this investment money? I mean, I heard that the, the Lancaster was in the um, high 100,000 range for development. And they expect him to just sort of hold on to them and sit on them. I mean, why would he give them to another company to make money on when he got <laughs> all the development costs on? So I did a quick look on Amazon and eBay, and these are the prices now. Now they're still expensive, but you know, they're not as expensive as I thought when you think there'd be this big scurrying around for these things as collector's items. And of course they go up every day, and certainly if you're holding on to them, they're bound to be even more valuable in the coming years. Yeah, the, the real uh, uh, denominator here is the number of bids on some of them, right? That's, that's a good indicator. Good point. Yep. 
like look at that uh that large bomber the the one you mentioned is at well four bids on that one one above is 13 bids yeah beautiful kit well, if do you remember there was a stir about the main kit coming out and it being a wingnut wings kit i mean it was the same scale and people had expected wingnut wings to come out with a uh, a Fokker DR1. Well, um, a modeler in New Zealand did some forensics based on looking at the Sopwith triplane, which they had uh, Wing the Wings had announced a few years ago, and he looked at the differences between the kits, and he was pretty convincing in saying to us that um, there's really the, the DR1 is not a Wing the Wings kit. However, um, it's not a bad. That doesn't mean it's a bad kit. It's just not up to that standard and those characteristics of the wingnut wings kids. And of course, I think you're all aware of the damage wing spar on the, uh, on the main kit, even though that's fairly easy to fix. One thing I was surprised at is that over the years, um, not a lot of model companies, in fact, I, I can only find one, sort of um, did a, uh, a copying or a copying of the best practice of the wing nut wing manuals. Um, I've heard that you can even bid on these on eBay. After people build them, they put the directions up on eBay. <laughs> but you can see these relief, these relief pictures and references and all that were just something to behold. One of the people on my call did come up with another company that was trying to replicate that, and that's a CSM with their armored cars. Right. And planes. Okay. Another company that does amazing instructions is uh, Tameo, T-A-M-E-O. They're an Italian company that does 43rd scale white metal um, Formula One cars. Their instructions are are top notch as well. Absolutely gorgeous. Thanks for that, Vince. So here's a theory, which is a little bit out there, but I think I'm gonna try and present it in a way so some of you guys may even believe me. But was it the beauty? Was Peter Jackson's fascination with this company the result of some other things like rel failed relationships and all that made it doomed from the beginning? So I'm going to bring you down to uh, my neck of the woods. This is about 45 minutes from me. I don't know how many of you people have participated in this uh, uh, um, museum and air show, but it's the old Rhinebeck Aerodrome. Mm -hmm. And apparently yeah. Rhinebeck is also a knitting mecca as well. My, my wife keeps threatening, well, post-COVID, I think she and her friends are going to go down to, what's that Rhinebeck knitting thing called? The Rhinebeck Sheep and Wool Festival is supposed to be um, like this, you know, Woodstock for, for knitters. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Well, Eugene uh, DeMarco is a uh, character. He soloed at 15. He uh, got a mechanical engineering degree, worked for IBM, got bored with it, and started volunteering and being a pilot and, you know, organizer, director at Rhinebeck Aerodrome. So he worked himself into this uh, organization. And if you ever get down here to be a show, be at a show, I'll be happy to um, guide you around the uh, facility, but they've got some great stuff. Now, once um, he got involved, he was very uh, resourceful. Uh, the show needed a, uh, a Piper Cub, and here it is. Um, basically what happens during the show is a, a farmer staggers into the airplane and you've probably seen this at our shows somehow he falls on the throttle and the thing takes off and of course he's he's an accomplished uh, stunt pilot but the crowd loves it well they needed a new one and uh eugene had a very novel approach to um to sourcing one do you know what he did no he stole one <laughs> he went into a nearby um commercial airport where there was one and, and, and pulled it out and flew it off to uh, Rhinebeck. And uh, he ran this on for a couple years before he finally got caught by uh, the authorities and it was a class one felony. He didn't serve any time. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> Guess there's no locks on them. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it's kind of hard. I think that the uh, when you're continually updating an airplane, there's lots of serial numbers and verification signatures, all that kind of stuff. That you, it's not like a car, right? So uh, somehow it got it caught up with him. Well, Peter Jackson, in the world of these uh, very rare aircraft, um, needed some engines for his uh, production line. He builds these things in New Zealand. And I guess it's easy enough to uh, make an airplane, you know, or like, like you would scratch build a model, but it's a little bit tougher to um, recreate an engine that's going to be authentic and deliver the same performance and such for the pilot. So um, Eugene sold him some and they, caught, they sort of came up with this relationship. So eventually Eugene ended up in um, New Zealand running some of uh, Peter Jackson's operations. So if you're not familiar, the Rhinebeck operation is actually dwarfed by what uh, Peter Jackson does in some of his, as, his, some of his companies down in um, New Zealand. And this is, this is just the German equipment. Wow. So one day Peter Jackson and his wife are looking on uh, Facebook and they see this acquisition by a fellow World One aviation buff. You know, these guys must be really loaded. And uh, he says, hey, that's my plane. And he, the problem was is that uh, Eugene had sold this to the collector, but he had forgotten to inform Peter Jackson. Oh, oh my. And then he'd also taken the money and borrowed some additional money from Peter Jackson's foundation. And again, he must have been a very forgetful person. He didn't um, tell anybody that he borrowed all the money. So to make a long story short, this ended up in court. And uh, when you think about um, Peter Jackson, he may be worth $400 million, but he's not going to, um, he's not going to pay for a new movie out of his own checkbook. He needs investors. He's like a corporation. He, mm-hmm. he has stock in himself and he can't have employees uh, ripping him off. And this ended up in the courts. Likewise, you can't have uh, model companies and other hobby businesses bleeding cash. So he hired a, um, a CEO and a CFO to sort of clean up his operations. And of course, um, Eugene ended up in jail. He was recently paroled this last December and they're trying to recover all the money from him. But uh, they also decided that the uh, wing that wings operation was so expensive they couldn't continue to operate it. So Peter Jackson um, let it go. And hopefully over the years, we'll find out more about what happened and uh, determine if maybe we see some of these models again, but it's gonna be unlikely it's all gonna come together like it did for Wingnut Wings. Right after I gave this presentation to the uh, Hudson Valley Club, uh, Vanity Fair the next day came out with an expose article that I encourage you all to read. But here, but in conclusion, you know, here's Wingnut Wings. If you bought and invested in some of their kits, then you can continue to enjoy what a great model company they were years in the future because they are sophisticated builds. And uh, if you didn't, uh, like me, I have one one of them on the shelf. Um, well, wing that wings, we hardly knew you. <laughs> well, that, that's it, Harvey, unless there's any questions. Sure. I've got a question, Mark. But now, now you're saying that people are saying that it's, it's highly unlikely that he'll bring them back. And I would think that th- there's, there's a lot, there's two drivers here. One is he's going to bring them back because it's a hobby, he's got money, and uh, it's interesting, right? The mm-hmm. second thing is, it's, it's, it's a money loss, and he doesn't want to include that anymore. Um, this guy seems to always be able to get money and funding from somewhere. Um, d- d- do you think that there's any remote chance that he, in your opinion, that you know, on his whim, he could just come back and say, you know what, I'm bringing this back, I got some money now, I don't care if it's a loss, I'm gonna bring it back. What, what do you think? Well, that, that's a really good question. In fact, I brought back this slide. You know, there's always the case that um, Meng was doing some of the um, work for him. And they might, Wing That Wings may have owed Meng a lot of money. And they just said, look, give us what the research up to date and we'll finish it off quickly as a model. Mm. And that's why we saw the, the DR1. Mm. The, the other question is, um, 
you know, where are they now? And all the people have been <coughs> released. So I think there were 12 full-time employees. Again, remember, these are just like research people and right. managers and stuff. All the other stuff was done in the far east, <coughs> the right. packaging and all. So they're all going off to find other jobs. He would have to recreate the whole operation again. And um, the, uh, but, but, but I will tell you one thing, they must have had a lot of surplus kits because the last I heard a couple weeks ago was they showed up at an air show in Australia <gasps> and uh, with just tons of kits to sell. Oh, so, that? so, you know, you may, you may, uh, this thing may not be dead yet. Mm. I think the air show was in Austra in New Zealand itself at Wanaka. Okay. But still, they got them. Yeah. The other question around intellectual property, i.e. CAD drawings, um, artwork for decals, artwork, um, artwork for instructions. Um, I mean, that's on a hard disk somewhere or hard disks somewhere. Who's got that stuff? Because from there, if, you know, molds can be recreated, etc. cetera. Um, do we have any ideas to where the intellectual property is? Well, just put yourself in Peter Jackson's, I don't know, first of all, but put okay. yourself in his, his shoes. Um, if he just let his CFO and CO, CEO, the new cost conscious one, decide what to do, they probably would have sold all this stuff off, get whatever they could for it. They haven't done that. So I would guess that, uh, Peter Jackson is just saying, hold on to this stuff. And, you know, it's with a certain frame of mind, you know, five years, 10 years from now, he may uh, look at things differently. And uh, I mean, look, we're talking about history here. History is not going to change. It's always going to be the same. This has to be updated. So he can come out with this stuff and maybe uh, make a lot of people happy. But for right now, I think, you know, big eagles are involved and yeah. they're sitting on them. You know, Mark, I, uh, I have a quick question, Mark. Do uh, you know what, what's at the heart of all this uh, interest Peter has in aviation? Uh, did he have a, a, a great uncle or a, a family relative in the, in the Great War or something? I think he did have a, a grandfather or great-grandfather, but he was a ground pounder. I, I don't think it was um, an aviator. Now, when he was collecting stuff for that movie, They Shall Not Grow Old, he mentions in the... Uh, the after party, the part that comes after it, if you stick around in the theater, he talks to you about his enthusiasm towards this topic. And he said, uh, despite all the things he's collected, artillery, uniforms, and, and doing that, um, that documentary, he has tons of um, video that they ran through the same process of restoration on the uh, aviation stuff, the World War I aviation. Now, of course, you know, that's not gonna be flying video that's probably just going to be a lot of stuff on the on the ground you know ground crews working on stuff right so um but but you know what i'm there i'm buying my ticket yep yep um, i've heard um, the same thing actually and and i used to be in the television documentary world i i heard the same thing but it was kind of in the ethernet in the ether you know it was part of the you never know quite whether to believe it or not so thanks for that yep great well, look, these are great. thanks for the questions. I really enjoyed spending uh, this time with you. Harvey, I appreciate uh, the forum. Not at all. So uh, thank you, Mark. That's great. Thank you very much.